Hi, this is Mark Arnold at Fun Ideas Productions doing another Fun Ideas podcast. And today I have a special guest all the way from Australia, Keith Scott. Yay! <laughs> Uh, and now I've I've clicked something by mistake and, and I've lost the image. Now uh -oh. how do I get that back? Okay, uh, hmm. you're on my screen, so if you want to keep talking, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, just wonder if I've. Oh, I know. It's probably but no, no, that's not it either. Oh, I uh, can this part off <laughs> or this part out. I wonder if I, if I click on the link again. I wonder if uh, it says join the meeting, so I'll click it on again. Okay. That's good. Um, and I mean, you're fine in the meeting here, but if you can't oh, see. Oh, there we are. All it's right. It's all back again. Cool. All right. Let's do a new intro, and then I can just all right. lock this part off. Um, hi, this is Mark Arnold from Fun Ideas Productions, and we're doing another Fun Ideas podcast. And today on the show, we have keith scott yay who? <laughs> who is right well if you don't know who this gentleman is he wrote like honestly one of my favorite books about comic books and animation uh, it's called the oh. moose that roared thank you thank you Winkle moose yes <laughs> and so we'll ask about that obviously you were also the voice of bullwinkle and uh other characters and you're also basically an exceptional historian about like old time radio, TV, comic books, animation, whatever. I think you know yeah. that's correct. So yeah, I've got the same bug that we people like us have. You know, it's like <laughs> drawn drawn to showbiz like a moth to a flame when I was a kid, and it's never left me. And you know, I it's also like I don't know if it's a common thing, but. Um, a lot of us are not good at things like sport that 90% of the population are good at. So mm -hmm. it's like this left brain, right brain thing, I guess. <laughs> Same with me. I mean, I'm not that good at sports or, yeah. but I can type <laughs> so, <laughs> and I can write. So um, I guess uh, I've seen you in other interviews, but I, you know, I'm still going to do this. I always ask, you know, sure. tell, tell me a little bit about yourself. And I don't know, I do have a question to have mm. you, tell me did you try to become a writer or a voice artist or what were you trying to become when you were growing up oh um originally when i was growing up i wanted to be an animator because i as a, a hobby i you know i love drawing caricatures and you know i was a mad magazine collector of all my life <laughs> but um no, I think around about my teenage years is when um, the jay ward bug hit and the warner brothers and all that and i really started developing an interest in doing voices you know for a living um but there was something about um my nature that was also very interested in the historical side and i'd been collecting since of the same age i got interested in voices i was also a big lover of old in the old days when when every commercial channel on tv used to show hundreds of the old black and white movies from the 30s and 40s and 50s Mm -hmm. That was my education because um, I started collecting books on films and things. I've got a gigantic, um, you know, cave downstairs full of all of this stuff. And uh, I can't let go and, and just live, you know, with the cloud these days. I've got to have the, <laughs> it's like physical media and books. Anyway, so. yep. <clears throat> but uh, along with that interest, I, I, I knew in terms of the living that I wanted to do um, voices and impersonations because it was something I just grew up with. And, and to that end, I, I think I was probably one of the first people of the so-called boomer generation who began writing to people like Doss Butler and Bill Scott and June Foray. And I was amazed to get detailed answers from them mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, like you know, everyone, like my mother saying, oh, these people will be too busy, you know, you know, they'll probably appreciate you know, and they might send you a picture. But I got these, especially Bill Scott. He was writing these long letters. And <laughs> when I met him, like he, he told me that he recognized himself in me when I was 17, 18. He said, I was exactly that age when I, he said, I started remembering the credits on the cartoons in theaters. <laughs> he said, probably the only person in Denver, well, he met another guy, you know. Mm -hmm. you, you always meet some other person that, that makes you think, oh, good, I'm not the only oddball. You know? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So I, th that's really what happened. When I got a response from Dorse Butler, it was one of those serendipity things because um, I got a response from him in December of 70. Mm -hmm. And the following year, I was just finishing high school and um, doing a little part-time university course that I had a scholarship for, um, but I, my heart wasn't in it, you know? It was like, I don't, you know, I don't know. I wanted to get into showbiz, but I had absolutely no idea of how to, mm -hmm. but um, the letter from Doris Butler was so encouraging. Um, and just at that time, when talking about serendipity, Bill Hanna <clears throat> was opening a, a branch of a Hanna-Barbera in Sydney, you know, with all the offshore animation and so on. And yep. he was living here for a full 12 months, getting it up and running hmm. with a lot of good young Australian animators. And so I heard about this at some office job I'd taken just to make a, a bit of money. And um, it was the old thing about... Um, just being in the right place at the right time. This girl said, oh, a friend of mine um, works at Hanna-Barbera in Sydney. And I went, Baby. I said, what? <laughs> and she she um, she told me where it was and I looked it up. And um, and so I, I, I just, as I was going home on the train that night, I, I thought, I've got letters from Doris Butler. Mm. I just got them recently and photographs and, and things. And he's given me instructions on how to do voices. If I took all that and showed Bill Hanna, well, I took it in and, and he was amazed um, <laughs> because, um, you know, first of all, I suppose it took a while to get used to my Australian accent, you know, and suddenly breaking into, well, I can do like uh, Mr. Jinx, uh, Mr. Hannah, you know, <laughs> doing all this nonsense. Mm -hmm. And um, so he gave me a job because I was only 18. He gave me a job <laughs> around the animation studio as a kind of a gopher, just to look. He said, would you like to learn the animation business? <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I did um, all sorts of things, photo Xeroxing all of their things for the head animators. At that time, they were animating the series Funky Phantom in Australia. Yeah. And they were just starting to do um, a very adult series, which was like The Simpsons 20 years before its time called Wait Till Your Father Gets Home, you know? Very I well written. Yeah, yeah and, and then strangely enough, um, that job lasted for, I guess, the best part of a year, but it was very seasonal work and I was doing cell washing and all the usual things you hear everyone starts out doing. And um, after that, um, I, I got, I didn't get fired, I just got bumped because they said, at the moment, series have finished, we have yeah. no work for you in these departments, so bye-bye, um, we'll talk later. And by then, I'd done one job, one voiceover job, one of the animators, um, knew all about my passion for that and got me to do a, a thing. And, and because I'd done that, Bill Hanna, when I was leaving, gave me a reference, which I've still got, um, <laughs> which said, I've listened to this uh, man's voices and I would fully recommend, and I was, you know, again, just going on 19, <laughs> his name was so credible, Hanna Barbera Productions, worldwide company, right. that it got me an agent like straight away. In wow. fact, I really, I really wasn't ready. You know, I, I could do a lot of gimmick. As Doris Butler told me, you know, he said uh, when I met him, he said, um, "Yeah, that age." He said, "You've got all the gimmicks, but at that age, you really don't know what to do with all the gimmicks." Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like you need experience. But anyway, I started to get a trickle of voiceover work, and I um. Eventually, uh, it took about two or three years, but then I then it became a full time living because at the same time, another of my passions had been the old Ed Sullivan show and watching all of the guys who could do impersonations. You know, Will Jordan and um, Frank Gorsh and Rich Little, all these people, and that really um, hit some nerve because I was doing that in school in in some of the um, stage productions and things and. The teachers were actually um, saying, you've got a, an ability at this, meaning this is coming from an adult. So again, I started, and again, no idea, but I started trying <laughs> to work out a, an act of what to do on stage and suddenly met a couple of radio guys as I was doing these few little voiceovers who said, um, oh, what you should do is ring this guy. And he, he books all of these um, clubs that have talent quests, you know, like a very primitive form of The Voice or some show like that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, America's Got Talent or whatever you might think of today, very low, but they still used to get professionals in as judges, you know, that mm -hmm. the old thing of three people sitting there like this. So like the <laughs> Ted Mack amateur hours. Yeah, like exactly. That. Yeah, <laughs> it was. <laughs> but, you know, the good thing was um, I, I kept practicing in the voices 
as much as I diligently could. And, um, and so I was winning these things simply because everyone else was a singer and like everyone else was doing <laughs> y- young kids of 19 doing Robin Gibb from the Bee Gees, all of them. Like, <laughs> and so suddenly I was this oddball doing the prime minister of Australia and <laughs> John Wayne and all. <laughs> so that's how I started. It really was, um, and I, I think in some ways, because um, I didn't go through what actors go through, like a training course and so on, um, I, I think some ways it's a good way because you you really, it's the old school of hard knocks and you learn very quickly what to do and what not to do. Mm-hmm. But uh, I started getting a lot of, um, you know, work in, in radio and TV commercials and Hanna-Barbera still used me. They used me um, even though um, I wasn't working there anymore. In about 76, they had a, a um, commercial for the, you know, the pebbles um, uh, snack. Oh, yeah. Fruit, fruit pebbles and chocolate Fruity pebbles. pebbles. Chocolate. Yeah, they're still around, yeah. yeah. yeah 50th anniversary right. this year, actually. Wow. Yeah. yeah well, <laughs> it was, it, again, it was one of those things that was imported down under here. And and um, and because it was, you know, Flintstones oriented pebbles, uh, they got me to do Fred and Barney on the, mm. these um, mm. animated TV commercials. And my God, I was only... I guess 1976. What was I going on 23? Mm. And um, and a couple of the actors um, who did character voices in Sydney were much older than me and said, uh, "Well, we leave that to you because we don't want to hurt our voice." But you know, the <laughs> Fred Flintstone <laughs> <laughs> had that that big um, voice. Um, so where are my fruit sorus pebbles? <laughs> so how did that work? Uh, they sorry, were, they were here. sorry. <laughs> Continue. I'm sorry. No, that's all right. I, I so how, how did that work? I mean, it's like were these cartoons made for the Australian market? Is that what it yeah, was? Yeah, they, they were oh, okay. they were Australian was, ones. Oh, okay. Because I was wondering why didn't they get Mel Blanc and Alan Reed yeah. or Henry Corden? Well, wow. especially in those days where it would have been difficult in in terms of just the time cha- change and and okay. getting them shipped by plane and all of that the tracks. But I think um, they were happy enough with my takes on them, and I think also. There was a rule, like a union rule, I guess it's the same in Canada, where um, with commercials, even if it's, a, a say, a United States product, they still, to, get, to give locals work in every area of the film industry, including the actors, um, that's, a, that's a, a union thing. I think even the Screen Actors Guild in the US recognizes like an international rule where, you know, we, we won't dominate the whole thing, even though America is, let's face it, the, the um, dominant showbiz country you know has been you know since since silent films is <laughs> well you kind of answered one of my questions but i'm going to ask it anyway it's like sure. so you're based in australia actually where did you mm-hmm. grow up in australia just uh, in in sydney on the, on oh, the okay. east coast yeah All right. mm-hmm. um i know that's a big place within australia but mm-hmm. i mean did you ever think whatever you did would be eventually worldwide where you'd come to the states or you said i'm just going to try to make it big here or what were your goals on that too? it was always a, a um i think it i think anyone from um down here or new zealand or england uh who's in showbiz always dreams of doing american jobs um yeah. it as it turned out the the career i started getting became very busy from about 78 onwards and i was I was then able to afford going and seeing all of my, see, one of the things that happened while I was still waiting to get into it and still, you know, just around the time I, I contacted Bill Hanna was that June Foray had responded to my letter and put me onto Corey Burton as a, as a, uh, somebody, you know, we had common interest. Like, uh, I think his first letter to me in August of 71 said, um, welcome to the J Ward Society, the International J Ward Society and Voice Lovers Anonymous. And then he goes, such a society really doesn't exist, but I had no other way to stay. <laughs> and so we, 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 we started doing all these very studious and scholarly letters back and forth to each other as he was still in high school at the time. I was a couple of years older. And, um, and so, um, and, and the other thing was, uh, as I mentioned in the book, uh, I won a trip in 73 to Hollywood, just from seeing one of those TV guide type things about, answer these questions about movies and we you could win it and he, i just thought oh, I'll, I'll be one of thousands who enters this contest and i won it you know well okay. um, i think but I one, 
one of the reasons I did was that uh, there, there was also, you, you answered five questions about movies and then they said, please tell us in 25 words why you should go to Hollywood. So I told them about my interest in Paul Freeze and Dawes, and it was such a bizarre answer. They, they thought, oh, we've got to let this guy win. This is too... <laughs> and he said, besides, there's a story in this for our magazine. So I immediately, went in, when we were in Hollywood, my parents came with me, they did their own touristy thing and I knew all of these contacts. So I started seeing Corey and going down to Jay Ward's studio. I met Skip Craig, who was on the um, recent Bill Scott documentary. Right. He got me into old time radio, you know, because I, again, it was like, uh, I've got all these uh, radio shows that we sell and a lot of them have Paul Fries and Bill Conrad. And I would go, oh, I've got to, I've got to have wait, these. Wait, you know? wait, wait. Yes, yeah. Because I, of, of all the voices I did, the Jay Ward ones were my favorites. You know, uh, I'd heard that the guys used to be in radio, but I had no idea what, what they meant by that. I thought they right. meant like a disc jockey, you know. So when right. I started hearing all these dramatic shows like horror shows and westerns and things, it was like this, I'd, I'd died and gone to heaven. You know, it was like, right. oh, here's another hobby that's going to, you know, make me as poor as a, as a heroin addict <laughs> twice as expensive and um so that that um again you know um probably um all of those things happening like in in one fell swoop with all these contacts and new friends and so on in the states but as you, as to answer your question i started getting such a career here i was happy to just make a once a year trip to la and then if anything ever happened well, as it turned out, I did 20 years in Australia before I, I, um, I think I was good enough to work in the US because I had by then I'd done that demo I sent you of all the J Ward voices. Right. And, um, and I don't know if I described this, but um, June Foray took Corey Burton and myself to dinner one night. This is in 1991. So 20 years later, I'd done that demo. And I gave her a copy. In, in those days, even as recently as 91, it was still on cassette, believe it or right, not. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> even before they started on CDs. <clears throat> but um, she, uh, by then, uh, the, the voices were pretty accurate. And she was like, oh, you know, because all the guys had now died. Bill Scott and Paul Fries. Right. Um, Doris Butler. And um, so unbeknownst to me, this was just to, because I, I just did it in case they were ever going to do anything with those characters again. I had no idea right. that by sheer coincidence, Tiffany Ward at that stage was talking about reviving the characters, the Jay Ward characters. Because mm -hmm. um, the Disney Buena Vista DVD, uh, no, VHS tapes had just come out. Then. Right, exactly. It was the yeah. first time, I think, the Jay Ward cartoons had had a kind of a publicity thing in 20 years. Yeah. So anyway unbeknownst to me after that we went to dinner with june foray she rang don pitts her agent and played the tape over the phone to him <laughs> and and i had no idea i was staying in the holiday inn on highland and hollywood boulevard and um and um i had no idea that don pitts i knew he was her agent because i'd heard of him when he used to look after paul Fries with uh, charlie stern and um his a his office was directly across the street from the hotel I was staying. I had no wow. idea. This is all wow. these weird coincidences <laughs> that happened to me. And yeah. I get this phone call from this guy. He's going, Don, Don Pitts, one of these guys had a funny, funny, husky little voice like this. Yeah. Hey, Keith, uh, June Ferry played me your, your, your uh, demo from last night on the on the phone. I want to represent you here in America. And it was like, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. it was like a three stooges. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so from, and, and within a year, Tiffany Ward got me, uh, flew me over, and and I was working with June Foray and Corey Burton doing these. I guess they were soundtracks for a stage show at Universal Theme Park, mm, okay. and they went on for a few years. I came back in a few years later and did uh, several sessions for the one in Florida, the the, the um, Universal Islands of Adventure, mm -hmm. and um, Corey always did a great Hans Conried impression. Right. So he was snidely whiplash and. For this one, I, I it was Islands of Adventure, Dudley Do Right's Ripsaw Falls, or something like that. <laughs> and so I did Dudley Do Right with the Maltese and uh, Inspector Fenwick and, and these voices. And uh, somebody told me they're still playing. They're still playing in this theme park in Orlando, believe it or not. I believe it. Um, yeah, I, I think yeah. that's right. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then by then, they also got me to do a, at the same theme park, Popeye and Bluto. So for a little while, 
<laughs> just for about a year, I was the American voice of Popeye and Bluto. It was based on the old Max Fleischer one, you know, the classics. Mm -hmm. And um, but really, the the voices doing the voices for the Jay Ward characters lasted for twenty years in my throat. I was very blessed and and eternally grateful. Nineteen ninety two and finished around about twenty twelve when classic media handed over the rights to all the Jay Ward characters. I think they went to DreamWorks. They're, that's who's got yeah. them now. Yeah, and Universal and, owns DreamWorks, all that stuff. Oh, is that, but so, it's so still Universal kind of a separate thing. Up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's still kind of a separate thing, but yeah. Right, right. Well, it didn't matter because I, I, I had the great years with that, you know, and, and I, I know the movie tanked, you know, the Rocky and Bullwinkle movie, <laughs> The Adventures of, but I still loved working on it because it was just, and it was the one time I really had uh, I was living over there for six months and then they flew me from Sydney to LA the following year to, yeah. to do post-production 10 times. They were, you know, a big $80 million <laughs> movie with CGI. They were spending money left, right and center. And yeah. I, even at that age, uh, in my forties, I was still naive. I was saying, you sure you can afford to keep flying me? Cause they have to fly you first class. Right, if you right. live 75 miles or more from your, your place of work, <laughs> you gotta go first class. <laughs> So I, I lived 1,400 miles. <laughs> so um, that was bizarre because it was like 10 times, you know, then, then somebody said, you know, come on, said Universal's got a fleet rate with Continental Airlines. You know, this, this, is, this is a drop in the ocean to them. Um, <laughs> uh, please don't, don't worry about this. And they're writing it all off on their tax anyways. <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, they did. And, and it got ridiculous because being a big budget movie, they flew me over one time to do one sentence. Wow. <laughs> yeah, That's Bullwinkle, uh, we had the words wrong last time. We went, Bullwinkle would say, oh, sorry about that, Mark. <laughs> Whatever it was before was different. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so I lived that dream. Even before that, I was very happy that um, Disney um, did the George of the Jungle movie. And, and, um, and she, Tiffany wanted me to be the narrator of that because of the Paul Fries impersonation, you know. Mm -hmm. the mighty george on the bumble shorty village you know that mm -hmm. that voice and um so I, I got to narrate and strangely enough the the george of the jungle the first one with brendan fraser was was actually a big success yes and <laughs> and of course even even from the point of view of a, an anonymous voice um mm -hmm. if you're associated with the success i quickly learned that um that you're um asked to do a lot of other things mm -hmm. And uh, so I was getting commercials and all sorts of things. So I, I lived the American dream for a good solid um, 20 years and five of them going back and forth and physically mm -hmm. working in the States. And all of this before the age of instant communication like we've got now, you know. Right. A lot of the, a lot of the ones that I did back in the 90s were just ISDN was all they had in, in those days. Right. Uh, but I was, I was appointed for a little while the... Um, the Jay Ward channel on Cartoon Network. I was doing all those promos for America, mm. doing Boris and all of these characters, you know. So that's a very long, convoluted answer, but that that right. um, <laughs> it's been a long, convoluted, odd career. So. <laughs> right. I have a few uh, questions. Probably got, I'm going to jump around, but that's what we sure. do on the show. Yeah. So every, you know, I listen very intently, and I go, I got to ask him about this. I got to ask him about this. So mm. um, the, going back to the Hanna Barbera days, so. Um, right. That was the Southern Star Studios, wasn't it called that? Southern Star, I think. Didn't it, it have became, a name? Like it became Southern Star. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, in the earliest, I guess the first 10 years, it was simply called Hanna Barbera Productions, same as in okay. the US. Okay. But then they had in in like parenthesis Sydney branch, you know. Okay. I think they they may have had ones in Spain and all those places that they originally did runaway animation for. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And then you mentioned Funky Phantom. And then did you work on like the later stuff? I know they did like Dinky Dog on that, the all new Popeye hour and things yes. like that down there. They kept, they kept getting seasonal it, work. Yeah. And there's, but like I said, I only worked there for that one year in the office. So, oh, okay. Whatever. So you didn't come back, but did you come no, back to do voices? No, because you were by, down there. Okay. That's oh, yeah. Was, yeah. By okay. then, that was the way, by then I was starting to get into the field and, and making enough of a living. And before I got married, I was, you know, just single. So I, <laughs> I was able to live on even a few jobs every so often, plus right. these clubs I was starting to do stand up. <laughs> but um, but they used to still get me, as I mentioned, that Flintstones job, you know, 
Yeah. Um, and then later that year, there, there was um, this thing called the Yogi Shaker. It was like a milkshake thing. But uh, um, Doris Butler wrote me a letter saying, I think I recommended you to do Yogi down there. And sure enough, it came true. You know, <laughs> so I was like, want a real milkshake? Do, do, do it yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now on um and then one other one i wanted to mention is that i know of southern star was drag pack did you work on that one or no no i did i okay. didn't but okay. I, okay. I those are the ones i know off the yeah. top of my head i knew that were, were being from done. that time period like 70s right. early 80s so yeah. um but then now that brings up another question so you're doing like these uh commercials for pebbles and uh doing uh things like that are those available to see now like on youtube or anything or are they Gee, just like, gone yeah. i've seen a couple of there was one that we did for about 10 12 years for a company a tiling company called amber tiles okay. and that was a national thing where they got the rights for fred and barney and that because it was like slate tiles and all of that so that was the flintstones connection and they did some really good hannah barbera did some very nice local animation mm -hmm. of like the opening of the old show where fred's in the in the construction site oh yeah, yeah. um and um so for about, like I say, about 15 years, I was still on call to do some of their famous characters. I did Snagglepuss for something, Top Cat. And then at the, oh, gee, when I can't think of the date, but Bill Hanna came back in 1991 mm -hmm. just to visit and see the place. And, and also a local theme park here uh, called Australia's Wonderland, which was a big theme park, you know, um, out in the western suburbs, they they had a division. They did a deal called Hanna Barbera Land. Hmm. It was like one of those places that you know have all of the um, young guys dressed up in character costumes, mm -hmm. like they do with Warner Brothers characters. Um, so you'd see like uh, Huck and Yogi and and um, and Mr. Jinx in a stage show with music and all of that. Well, I did all the voice tracks for that for about fifteen years and. Um, oh. Okay. And it was running into William Hanna again when I was already by then established, and he knew that he was the one who gave me a break. He was as sharp as a, a whip, you know. Mm -hmm. And by then he was in his uh, mid seventies, mm. um, so um, it was. You know, I still went. Thank you. Great to see you again, boss. <laughs> yeah. Now is he the only yeah. one of the two you ever met? Did you ever meet Joe yeah. Barbera? Never did meet Joe Barbera. Yeah. Uh, he he was. Um, he was always on the more creative side. And I guess by then they were so successful that he was more of a bon vivant around Hollywood. Right. Whereas Bill Hanna, Bill Hanna just always loved doing the exposure sheets and timing music and all of that. But since he was in the 1930s with harmonizing, he, he's, he just, that was just his, his love and his hobby, you know, yeah. his passion. Yeah, Bill Hanna is the, um, the only one, Bill Hanna is the only one I ever met. Uh, it was an right. art, art gallery once and they oh, were right. both supposed to show up but only bill showed mm. up so you know yeah. and i i don't know how old he was he was basically retired but he was still you know pretty yeah. animated well it's so so. easy to know how old he was if you know the year because he was born in 1910 so just take off you yeah. know it was in the 90s sometimes so, yeah. was, so i know he's in his 80s but he wasn't yeah. like elderly like you know you mm. know they got when they were in their 90s you know there's he was still pretty Oh, he was right up until maybe the last 12 months where he, he started ailing, but uh, he was as bright as a, a button, you know, yeah. and a very nice man. Very yeah. nice. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that that uh, really is a, um, I think back and I think everything just fell into place for me. It wasn't ever planned, you know. These, now, these, now, uh, now you said you, in 73 when you flew out here on that trip. Um, mm hmm you went to Jay Ward Studios. Did you also go to Hanna Barbera at that time in Hollywood? Yes. Or? Yep. Okay. In fact, um, uh, again, because I already knew Doris Butler by then by letter, I got on so well with him. He had Corey Burton and me to his house where he had a, a proper recording studio built back in the 50s with, you know, real like the old RCA microphones and the whole bit. And um, he, um, he again saw something in us that we as school kids and, and late teens didn't even recognize. Um, um, so that was just him, you know, having observed a lot of people. But I think again, there weren't any, there was not anywhere near the amount of people who wanted to do voices like there are these days. It's like every, right. like everyone you meet, it wants to do voices. <laughs> <laughs> so it was kind of odd for these old timers and I heard from them years later where they said, yeah, we looked on you as the guys who were going to, you know, we were going to pass the torch to you, you know. Yeah. Um, 
if they'd said that, then we would have fallen into into a faint, you know. <laughs> Because like we when when I went on that trip, I, I met up with Corey Burton, and after my parents flew home, I stayed another couple of weeks, and um, we got in touch with Doris Butler. He said, "Hey, you guys," he said, "I'm doing a a speech at North Northridge, uh, whatever the college was there," and um, and so we go out there, and and you know this it's like coincidence after coincidence. You go there, and and who's running? the drama class that he's the guest speaker, the girl who used to do Hoppity Hooper, Chris Allen, you know, and they'd <laughs> wow. been friends for, for two decades. You know. So here's Corey and me in the car park later on asking her to do Hoppity Hooper. She'd retired from acting, you know, and she just suddenly burst into the voice. And it was like, if you ever meet one of those old timers doing that voice, it always sounds better than it ever sounded in person. You know, they, right. it's <laughs> like it just snaps back into them. They haven't done it for 10 years. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, I haven't heard her later, but I heard, uh, I think it was on a different radio show or podcast or something. It was Billy Richards who did the voice of the Rudolph, uh, the Rankin Bass yes. one. Yeah, yeah she, I, could, she could still do it later on, too. Was <laughs> she Canadian originally? Yes, I think most yes. of them were on those shows, which is really yeah, strange right. because most of them were animated in Japan. It's like really yeah. global <laughs> thing, you know. So. Now, was that, which, which show was that? She did the Rudolph ones. Ru Rudolph, oh, yeah, yeah. The Rankin uh, Bass. the original yeah. one with Burl Ives, Snowman. That's and right, yeah. The Shiny New Year and then another that's one. That's right. Yeah, so. That's where uh, I'd seen her name on many things. Yeah, that's I don't right. Know. I, I always forget. I always think everything's been exported to Australia, but you may have never seen it. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. We, we certainly saw all the Rankin Bass things. And, okay. and in fact, uh, one of the first things I when I met Paul Fries, who was intimidating to me until I met him, and then he, he, he was just fine, you know. <laughs> Um, but uh, yeah, there is another thing. I was as lucky where the Sydney Hanna Barbera place had a recording studio in the same building called Sound on Film. And um, like, I just I was still working there, and uh, Paul Fries, and finally answered a letter that I thought oh he he never did answer it, and he sent me a, a tape like a real tape from his own home studio, and it was uh, to my good friend. Uh, Keith Scott in Sydney, Australia. But you never thought you'd hear from me, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and so, so I, I immediately grabbed this tape and and um, and rushed to that place next door to Hanna Barbera and got them to do me a dub and sent it to Corey uh, in in LA. And he was going, "How did you do such a professional sounding dub?" <laughs> uh, but uh, all of these things, as I said, it was just like a tumble of things happened to me. And it was like, uh, you, you sometimes you, you got that feeling, well, this is fate, just saying, yeah, you know, don't give up because it's all meant to happen. You know? Right. It almost yeah. sounds like, have you read uh, Stan Freeberg's autobiography? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Where he talks about where he just says he's on a bus in L.A. and he says, oh, stop here. And he gets <laughs> off and walks into the first agent and he gets hired immediately. It's like, yes, that's, <laughs> yeah, I think it was Bob Clampett who used him for a Warner Brothers thing. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is that feeling. Yeah. And again, I think Freeberg was one of those people uh, who I think is a, you know, a, a satire, satire genius. But uh, apparently as a young kid, he was the biggest fan of Fred Allen Right. And Norman Corwin and all these radio people. So again, you could see that something would happen with him because he just loved that industry. You know, right, right. You love it so much, you have to be a part of it. Is I think right. is is the way it goes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I I was you know I haven't really talked about myself much, but I was the same way. But I was a little bit. I'm younger than you a little bit. I'm 54, but everyone's uh, younger than me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, for some reason, you know, I I was a little more shy, maybe. So I didn't think mm -hmm. of writing letters to people oh right. you know i just thought mm. oh they're too busy or something like yeah. that and then now i'm kind yeah. of kicking myself i should have done it nowadays i have no problem reaching out it's like keep sure. on my show you know sure, it's like yeah. you know yeah. but that's what time does you know you you get more comfortable talking to people oh you get you get more confident without <laughs> but, a doubt yeah you know. yeah and and i think the fact that you're a published author i mean that's a that's a a, a feather you know it's <laughs> yeah. a great feather to but have. Was, was that nerve-wracking to you to, like which, who was the first one you wrote to was it dawes or was it one yeah, Doris, Doris Butler was the first. Yeah, and the reason I wrote to him was that he just, he looked so friendly in some of the photographs I'd seen in in the, a guy living next door to us was in advertising and uh, he said he heard about what I wanted to do. And when I was in high school, he gave me his copy of the old double 
Best of the Stan Freeberg shows LP. Oh, yeah. And it had all these photos of Doris Butler and June Foray. And um, I was so naive, I wrote to Doris Butler, care of Screen Gems, who you saw at the end of all the Hanna Barbera. Because <laughs> <laughs> somehow they got it to his house. Yeah, that was my next question. I mean, did you have yeah. his address and how did you find no. it back then? Because no, I just took a just took a punt because I was, wow. I think I'd listened. <laughs> I'd listened on my little home reel-to-reel -reel machine to so many fractured fairy tales and things with his voice that I just thought I've got to try and meet this guy. You know, mm -hmm. um, I really felt drawn to his acting ability, and I loved what he did. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't have been. It, it as it turned out, he was known by all. If you ask Billy West or anyone, oh, yeah. he was the friendliest person in the business. You know, he, I think and, and so you know, you know, he opened up that um, acting school, right? Uh, I think it's Nancy Cart knowledge. I think it's Nancy Cartwright mm. who raves about her. Yes. I mean about yeah. them, I mean, excuse me. <laughs> and yeah. Bob Bergen, uh yeah. oh quite a quite a big cast of uh, people who've made it. Mm -hmm. We're all in his um, and I was the only international student. He used to get me to send tapes by airmail of some mm. of his scripts and he'd play them along with the ones to his American students, you know, saying, who the hell is he talking about? This guy in Australia, what? <laughs> <laughs> so as he, as I say, Doris Butler was the first. And then because I got such a great answer from him, it gave me the confidence right. <clears throat> to then, um, when I got I got ill with mumps in, in 1971, after I'd written to Doris Butler, and, and a side effect of that was that it sent me totally deaf in my left ear. Hmm. Now, there's a joke, you know? Are oh, you good at all these voices? Gee, you must have a good ear. <laughs> that, 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 that's that's what happened so while i was you know bemoaning the fact that oh it looks like i'm deaf in my left ear um i decided um it while i was still in in bed recovering to write to doors to june foray and bill scott because doors butler had told me in his letter you know how bill scott never took a credit as the voice right and i so i asked him I'm trying to figure out who did Bullwinkle and Dudley do right. And he said, all of those lead characters, Mr. Peabody, all of them are Bill Scott, Jay Wood's partner, and probably the best writer in, and, and, um, but he never had a credit. That was in his letter. Yeah. So I wrote to him because he had given me his address. He said, if you ever want to write to Bill, here it is and in Tahunga. <laughs> and, um, and then he gave me June Foray's address. And then, as I said, the minute she got the letter, she had just met Corey. He described this on the on the Amber documentary, mm -hmm. where he, June Foray knew his father's brother, and um, yeah, oh, we know that woman, you know. His parents <laughs> said so. Um, he got in touch with her, and she took him that week to a Jay Ward session. So she got to see William Conrad and Paul Fries and all these guys interacting. Even Joe Flynn from McHale's Navy when wow. he was King Biter Man, you know. Wow. Um, so when he wrote that first letter to me and told me he'd been to sessions, I was so jealous you couldn't believe it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. When I wrote to her, she immediately put me onto Corey Burton as a young guy with the same interests as me. So, right. As I said, all these things were were it was like fate, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, did you end up ever meeting Paul Fries as well? Oh, or? yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. As a matter of fact, uh, I'd written to him, and that's why he, he sent me the um, tape. But when I came to Hollywood in 73, it was a year afterwards, and he, he, I let him know I was coming. So I rang the Charles Stern Agency, and they said, uh, he's down on Santa Monica Boulevard at Radio Recorders. I guess that was the oldest studio in town then. Mm -hmm. um, doing a Jolly Green Giant commercial, and he'd love to see you. So I little little knowing how long the streets are in Hollywood, I ran out of the <laughs> Holiday Inn on Highland and Hollywood and thought it was just a five minute run, but it was like a 20 minute run down to Santa Monica Boulevard, yeah. yeah. But I, there it was, there was the studio and I walk in and he's in the middle of recording and he knew I was the guy that, you know, he wanted to meet him because there was something about it, the way I must have had a hopeful look on my face or something. <laughs> and so, um, he came out after he'd finished the scene and he goes ladies and gentlemen all the way from down under and then the director goes to freeze shut up we're still recording <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so yeah and he and when we got talking um he, he just started doing like he did his peter laurie voice for me and all, all this stuff it was again like old home week you know wow. the only one i didn't get to meet on that trip was um william conrad I got to meet him years later when I was writing the the book, but um, mm. 
when Bill Scott took me to lunch, that was the, that's when I got serious about the writing side of it. Mm-hmm. Way back when we started talking about, you know, am I also a historian? Mm-hmm. I was an accidental one in the terms of the cartoons because um, as I mentioned on that thing with Amber, uh, <clears throat> he took me to lunch at a, a restaurant that no longer li- is there, but it used to be opposite the corner where Jay Wood's shop was called Frascati. Oh, okay. I'm trying to think yeah. because yeah, yeah. I used to be right, like, right near the Chateau Marmont, know, you know that, yeah. that. Yeah, I remember that now that now that you mentioned that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and of course he took me to lunch there, and and there's at another table there's Jay Ward with some of the animators I recognize their names like Lou Keller and people like that, mm-hmm. and um, I remember I'd just been to the the old Cherokee or Pickwick bookshop on Hollywood Boulevard, no longer there and found an old 1949 Academy Players directory with all the actors' pictures and that, and there's Paul Freeze who looked like a teenager. <laughs> and uh, and so just to, just for something to say to Jay Ward when Bill Scott introduced me, it was like, uh, oh, I just found this picture of Paul Freeze. And because he looked so young, mm-hmm. Jay Ward pointed at it and Lou Keller and him were laughing like little kids going, ah! <laughs> <laughs> So then when I sat with Bill Scott and he gave me like, two hours of his time at this lunch, he talked about everything from the Crusader Rabbit and how he admired Alex Anderson. Mm-hmm. He said he based a lot of his um, serial writing style on the way Alex Anderson did the serial chapters in Crusader Rabbit, right? which I didn't realize. No. But uh, that's when he said he'd seen some of the stuff I'd sent him in the mail, like lists and various things. He said, this is something, he said, a lot of this stuff you've done, he said, I know it's a hobby for you, but he said, it's it's more accurate than what we've got in the studio. <laughs> and that's when he said, you know, I, I predict, I predict without a crystal ball, he said, one day you will write a book about us. And hmm. that's when I said to Amber, I said, of course, at that age, you're thinking, yeah, sure. You know, I yeah. was very happy he said that. It came true 20 years later and he'd gone by then. The biggest, that's why I dedicated the book to him because he, he gave me the most physical help in that country in terms of yeah. spreading the name around and all this. And um, he had gone in November of 85, so he missed seeing the book by about six years. Mm. Uh, that's a pity, yeah. Right. Well, yeah, uh, Paul Fries didn't see it either, you know, yeah. It was like, exactly, yeah. 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 And it, it always kind of bummed me out that there, you know, there could have been possibly, but I know the story now, mm. could have been possibly another revival of Bullmacle one last time, but yeah, I yeah. know. I know, great. yeah. Well, as a matter of fact, he, uh, the, the fractured fairy tale that I did, The Fox, the Box, and the Locks, oh, yeah. mm-hmm. if you ever saw that with the Dudley Do Right movie, yeah. that, that was a script that he did for this proposed revival mm-hmm. that never did happen. Right. Uh, he did a Peabody, a Dudley, and a fairy tale, one of each. Mm-hmm. And the, when June, when, sorry, when Tiffany Ward was talking about not only the, the upcoming Rocky and Bullwinkle movie, she said, we also want to do some theatrical cartoons, you know, maybe a fractured fairy tale. So that's when I said, well, funny you, funny you should mention that. I've, I've got a script Bill Scott gave me hmm. for a proposed revival in the late, she knew the history, in the late 60s. So it never happened. She said, you have? And yeah. so I sent her the, and, and boy, by the time I got to Hollywood to do that movie, and there was still a, six weeks before they really needed me mm. for the shooting part, um, she th- there was she'd already made arrangements with a small animation company to do this short film and uh, I couldn't believe it you know it was like uh, wow the second day I was in town I was doing a fractured fairy tale this is like again this is all coming true for right. me you know? <laughs> I was wondering how that kind of came about because yeah it just suddenly appeared you know and it's it like did. oh yeah you know because if, you know um I tried to see all the live action ones as much as I could uh right. e- even if they have varying quality to be honest but um yeah uh that one was a surprise i didn't know they would do a fractured for neither and and i had no idea it was i think the original plan was it was going to open the rocky and bullwinkle movie ah, but okay. somehow it turned out that um it, it was for the dudley and i was i was not involved on the dudley do right yeah, i was going to ask you that yeah okay. yeah no Corey burton was the one chosen to narrate that and, and i'm glad because uh I, I would have hated him to think I was trying to, you know, take over certain jobs that he was just as enthused about Jay Ward and he should have done, you know. Right. But Did uh, you by do then he, he was, George of the Jungle too. There was like a sequel. It or, was terrible. It was like yeah. they did it. They actually filmed it in Australia, uh, up on the Gold Coast, where there is a film <laughs> studio. Like, uh, yeah. but it was 
I knew even doing it, it was this. Well, first of all, they couldn't get Brendan Fraser because by then he was much bigger. You know? Right. <laughs> um, they made a, a kind of a lame joke about, you know, in that in the movie. They said he, he's too big to do this now. So there's this cheap guy that <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of, kind of Jay Wardish, but, um, yeah, yeah. but the script was so, and, and as I was recording it, I was thinking this kind of sucks, you know, yeah. I'll, I'll do the best job I can. Yeah. But, but then again, John Cleese also did the same. The, the thing the, the sequel he did the, the ape voice again yeah and i thought well i'm in good company my god you know monty, <laughs> a monty python star boy right um but uh, but then the, they told me um right near the end of all the recording sessions they said uh looks like we're just straight to dvd <laughs> mm. <laughs> no yeah. theatrical yeah right yeah. um yeah well even dudley do right i think it did go to the theater but it was like out at maybe a week was, or something oh, yeah yeah I, you it know. Was, I i can say it now because nothing to do with not being in, involved with it but i i really didn't didn't like the humor in that right film yeah. I, they, they tried with the rocky <clears throat> bullwinkle one but mm -hmm. uh there were too many as the old cliche too many hands putting yeah. their two cents yeah. worth in and uh i was originally um recommended as not only the voices, but as a, a, a kind of a knowledgeable person about the ward property. So naturally that's gonna make any creative director get the hackles up saying, oh yeah. So he, yeah, yeah. so I had to kind of, I sensed that. So I had to temper anything that I, I said and not look like a knoll, you know, like a, yeah. um, but they, I, they asked me occasionally, you know, we need a better line here, whatever the line was. And I, I, again, I was so dumb. This was a major universal motion picture. And uh, I didn't realize that I gave him a couple of one-liners that are in that movie. And I should have got a fee for that, you know? Right. Now I, I learned so much of, of what I should have done on that movie. If, if another one came my way, I'd certainly be a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, my opinion of that film, I mean, I, I like it, but... Mm -hmm uh and i haven't seen it in years but i remember liking right. it but not loving it and yeah it has the same yeah. issue that i have with the later peabody and sherman cartoon is right. they have extra characters that i oh, don't feel need to be in the i film. know that's really well, keenan and kill yeah yeah keenan yeah. and kill were, were an example of where the director who was very well known on broadway but uh i think films were kind of new to him and uh so they're it, he he just made an executive decision that because his little daughter, who was like five or six, watched Keenan and Kel, therefore, well, that's the kid element. We'll get them in the movie. It was yeah. like, but they've got nothing to do with James. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Things like that, you know. I know right. I was really impressed with that Rene Russo spoke with June Ferre and really learned how to do the yeah. Natasha voice. She was good. Yeah. So the, uh, the principles I thought were great. So I thought yeah, you were great. Yeah. I thought June was great as Rocky. Uh, Renee, I, even Robert De Niro, even though it was yeah. kind of like <laughs> overblown casting, I said anybody yeah. could have done this, but I think he wanted to do it. It sounds like oh, he know? did. He did. Yeah. And and the funny funny thing was that he he um, being a method actor, it was really fascinating to just sit and watch his stuff because he he had to leave for another movie, so they concentrated on doing a lot of his stuff first, and one reason was that it was taken on by tribeca so that's his company so it was like almost inevitable that he would be in it because that was the period where he was doing a lot of um what his fans would call schlocky work that gave him money to do his artistic endeavors you know right um but he was he, he was he couldn't have been nicer and and i of course you're you know again very intimidated because he's so accomplished and <laughs> but he couldn't have been nicer and he just uh, on the read through um that was that was the thing that was scary for me because i was doing the narrator the william conrad voice in the movie mm -hmm. as well as bullwinkle and the opening five minutes with all these important executives and cast members and jason alexander all these people sitting around the table the whole first five minutes is me changing my voice back and forth and i'm thinking i'm, I'm sweating bullets and <laughs> <laughs> but as, as i look up i can see de niro doing his um That, that you know that kind of that's his his way of smiling <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then sure enough after a few a few weeks when there was all stuff done on the stage not not the location stuff um 
as the crew got to know me and, you know, and I'm always been like a comedian type. So I was doing all these voices in the long, long breaks where they'd set up the lighting and all that. And De Niro would occasionally overhear me. And I was doing like awesome wells from the third man and all these things that the crew were asking me to do. Hey, do you do Joseph Cotton and all this? <laughs> and uh, one day <clears throat> I didn't realize that uh, he, he was in that day because he had to do another wardrobe fitting. And he had overheard me doing a quick, you're talking to me? Keep talking to me, yeah. So <laughs> two days later, he must have planned this, but two days later, he comes over in, in a little break and he says, uh, and he's dressed up in the fearless leader thing, and he goes, You talking like me, huh? Yeah, you talking. <laughs> so it's like it, I just burst out with laughter, and that's the reaction he wanted, you know. But uh, who would have thought that De Niro would just <laughs> so you know, these are the little stories you can dine out on for the rest of your life but <laughs> right um how'd you get along with jason alexander uh, was he you know he was uh, uh, I, he was involved with he was or... always friendly he was friendly yeah. enough to me because i guess yeah. i was like a fellow pro i know de niro thought i was very professional oh, okay. but um um he gave me the impression and he certainly gave a lot of the crew the impression that he really didn't want the, this job and he was a bit uh <laughs> it was like a bit of hard work yeah i think uh he just looked a bit um, uninterested in the in the project. I don't know, you know. I just got that vibe, and and apparently he um, ticked off a few people, like the publicity guy. He wasn't. He was never available to do little interviews and things, and he should have been. Mm. So I think maybe maybe the whole thing is the fact that Seinfeld had just ended, and he cashed in big time, you know, right. um, with you know a lifetime of the obvious residuals that he would have got with that maybe um he just yeah. felt this was a bit beneath him i don't know it was also that period i think he was going through where he was trying to be on tv doing broadway type things and all that i always right. thought like if he was from a different era yeah i think yeah. the best work i ever saw him do is that really unpleasant little guy in in pretty woman who uh, oh, yeah. roughed up <laughs> roughed up julia roberts i thought back in the old days of hollywood he would have made a living like ed brophy doing all these uh, right. types of roles in movie after movie <laughs> <laughs> i i didn't expect you to mention that one i thought you were going to say shallow how Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, no, no. no. It was just, just, just because uh, I, I was thinking about his actual acting quality, and uh, um, so that's really where he shines, where he can play yeah. something that's unpleasant. Yeah, but I guess like he was so well known. I think he was so famous after Seinfeld that, um, and that show was such a success, such an enormous success that uh, I think maybe he felt this Boris Badenov lookalike thing was a bit beneath him. Yeah. Um, they did say that some people were purists saying, oh, I wish they'd got Danny DeVito. He would have been a better Boris. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Now, you weren't involved in that other one that uh, came out a few years, Boris and Natasha that had uh, Sally Kellerman. And, no, uh, no, that was that was before. That was before I was involved. Okay. All right. That, that came that came first. That was uh, Dave Thomas from SCTV. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And, and Sally then I think June, June has a cameo in that she one. She does. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. No, <laughs> I think that was about three or four years. I think Jay Ward was still alive okay. when that was being made. Maybe the last year of his life. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's It's always a struggle with probably with everybody, but with me too. You know, it's like making live action versions of cartoons you just oh yeah you know, you know yeah. it's like and they don't always yeah. come off you know and it's like uh, and even when they do kind of come off visually like say robin williams and popeye you know there's still always like a little element I know, yeah it's like mm, oh know. totally <laughs> yeah i mean the same thing like when in the rocky and bullwinkle one uh one of the cameo guys was john goodman mm -hmm. and it was just a, a highway cop or something but the day he shot it, you know, they were talking about because um, the Flintstones movie had tanked a bit too. I think it yeah, wasn't yeah, as yeah. yeah, or or it got bad reviews or something. Yeah. Um, and he was laughing at me doing the voice of Bullwinkle. This is during one of the breaks, <laughs> mm -hmm. and I said, uh, and I started doing. Fred Flintstone's voice and he goes oh don't and he, and he pretends to cry like why was I why was uh, I ever in that, that stinker movie <laughs> uh, he was actually a very nice very nice to meet um yeah. very funny 
Kind of John John Goodman, you know, a kind of kind kind of an oafish oafish sort of guy. <laughs> Play yeah. the guy he played in um, the Big Lebowski. You know? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> that had just that had just come out actually just before right. while we were doing that movie and it was a, a real cult hit you know oh yeah yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> um jumping around again um so i was curious because the first time i went to the the ward studios was like pretty much after they were done i right, think yeah. they were still doing it seems like the first time I went, they were still doing some Captain Crunch. It was probably early right. 80s. But mm -hmm. in 73, were they doing anything else other than the Quaker stuff? Or were they considering more pilots still? Or were they kind of done there? Only too? they'd just done two pilots. Right. It was kind of in the back of their mind. But Jay Ward was really burned by George of the Jungle TV show experience. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think... Um, they were really happy by then that uh, they'd reached an age where they were just living off the Quaker account. Okay. And in 73, it was still about another, oh, geez, another good six or seven years of that before it started, before they started dictating policy and the, the guys were so old by then they heard, I'm sick of this. I'm not going right. to do this anymore, you know, because I, I remember back in 79, which was the first year I was able to afford to go out Hollywood regular basis. Mm -hmm. Bill Scott said, hey, there's a session this afternoon. And of course, I was in there, like a, some of those photos Amber used of me standing with Doris Butler and Bill Scott were taken on that day in 79. And Paul Fries was down from San Francisco to do that. So it was great to see them all in the studio doing a full Quaker session for Jay Ward, who was mm. <clears throat> walking around directing them. And uh, and Paul Fries, I remember he, he's, he was still like the world's biggest show off you know and uh <laughs> um he came waltzing into the studio this short little guy with this enormous voice <laughs> mm -hmm. and saying to jay ward i have a new character jay um <laughs> it's a a gay black man <laughs> so we start talking like this doing this and jay ward just stood there <laughs> and took one one of his fresca drinks and went <laughs> you know, Paul, we're never going to be able to use that voice. <laughs> <laughs> Is that how Jay Ward sounded? I actually never knew. Yeah, that. he did. He had he had kind of a <clears throat> how did he talk? Uh, uh, <clears throat> a Rocky and Bullwinkle uh, uh, episode three hundred and sixty, take one. Uh -huh. He had that kind of voice, but he uh -huh. had a nervous giggle. Uh -huh. There was like a, a lifelong nervous giggle, and so. Uh, You'd say, um, gee, uh, I heard somebody, um, some famous actor died last week. <laughs> really? Oh, that's, uh, <laughs> it almost sounded like he was laughing at something cruel, you know, but he wasn't. It was just this, this affliction wow. that he had. Because <laughs> yeah. I never actually met him. I mean, I, I probably written this before, mentioned it before. Uh, I went to the, it was just the Dudley Do Right Emporium. Everything else right. was closed yeah. by the time I went in. Um, sure. I think 82 is probably the first time, but I went like two or three times a year till, I don't know, till they closed it. I don't know when that was. And then I went after, the last time I went was after they closed it. And I got right. a piece of the piece of the thing, you know, a piece of wood, which I think my dad <laughs> threw away one day. And it's like, what? You know, he goes, there was termites in it. And it's like, okay. Yeah. But um, now did you, did you see where the original statue was? just yes. a few doors yeah. up the bull and statue. that was one yeah. thing i was going to ask you about but uh first of all when i went in 82 or something i never met jay ward i met tiffany and i met the wife or mother, mother. Yeah, yeah billy billy yeah yeah is that her name okay and well, her uh, real name was ramona yeah okay but, but and, the, yeah and no one else was there at all uh, except mm -hmm. jay apparently was in the back and i remember one time when i left he was uh, in the back but he went up to the window and waved at me <laughs> and it's like well, that's my encounter with Jay Ward. He, he, he was, I, I he was doing that a lot. The big mustache, you know. Still. Big mustache, yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> again, he, he hid behind the mustache. He was very shy. Mm -hmm. um, he had to know somebody for a while before he was, he'd yeah. come. Loose. I think but he then, made because he thought it was neat that a kid, because I was still yeah. pretty young, was yeah. interested because he thought, you know, I mean, he'd probably be thrilled about Amber and Camden and stuff like that. Sure, oh, really absolutely, young. he would. He would you be know. more than thrilled, he would be. Yeah. 
and I was like that with him too, except I was lucky that when I met him at Frascati that day, Bill Scott had, had <clears throat> walked me over to their table and done this big spiel. He's been writing in, he's the, he's the guy who is, uh, he knows more about all the skeletons in our closets and all, you know, making them all laugh. So, yeah. so Jay Wood kind of um, was fine with me, especially after I showed him that picture of Paul Freeze. So I kept going back there and visiting the shop when Skip Craig used to work behind the counter sometimes and, and get more of his radio shows. And sometimes, <clears throat> and one day I was there with Corey Burton when he was still in high school. Mm -hmm. This is all still on that 73 trip. It was such a life changer, you know. And we were in the car park there at the old shop, you know. Where, and and uh, I said to Jay Ward, uh, after I asked him a few questions, and I said, I, I hope I'm, you know, not being too pushy and asking you all of these things because I know you're a busy man, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, uh, no, no, not at all. As a matter of fact, I find you pleasantly aggressive. <laughs> you that on your business card. Yeah. Yeah. Pleasantly yes. aggressive. Yes. Yeah. Quote, unquote, Jay Wood, <laughs> 1973. Right. So, yeah. so again, I think, I think by he, what he meant by that was that he could also recognize I was such an enthusiast and I was trying to learn very quickly the way business works and all that. He was a Harvard grad. He, he had an MBA. He knew all about how business works. So. Right. Well, he also, didn't he have a real estate license too? Yeah. And he also did that on the side, but nobody yeah. knows that or knew that. And well, he, he, um, he was going to go into real estate with the with the desire of going into showbiz if he could because he was always attracted to that mm. but um when he came back from harvard he got into re real estate um on purpose first of all mm -hmm. and then he had something to fall back on after crusader rabbit they lost the rights to that and i'd have to reread my own book now it's been so long i've forgotten right. some of the facts or the chronology you know right well, but, it was quite uh, a few years. It was almost a decade between Crusader yeah. and the first uh, Rocky and Bowling Bowl, right? It was. It was about eight years, I think. And and he had gone back. And apparently, uh, Harry McCracken says that the real estate business kept running all the way up past Jay Ward's death <laughs> until about 1987 or maybe even beyond that, because the, he had friends from the Bay Area that he'd known all his life who kept running the, the business for him. Yeah. I think that's why... It's not just the animation thing becoming a success. He was never a success on the Hanna-Barbera scale, of course. Right. Which is like gigantic, but uh, <clears throat> he was successful enough. And yet he, he had, they had properties up on Pebble Beach and all of this. And I think a lot of that was that his real estate business had quietly done quite well all these years as well, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, he was a, a quiet achiever and a, an enigma wrapped in, in an enigma in some ways, but very nice man, really. Yeah, very shy. Mm -hmm. Now, when you went there in 73, did it look run down or were they still using all the studios? Yeah, it was it was pretty run down then. I oh, mean, it was it run down then too, okay. Because it hadn't, really hadn't changed was, since like, the 50. It was peeling off. And yeah, the, oh yeah. The, the yeah. Rocky and Bullwinkle statue was all faded and everything. Yes. And I don't think it <laughs> worked anymore. You couldn't make it move uh, or whatever. You know? uh, and then next door was like, uh, I took photos i think somewhere and it has jay ward's annex or something it was like another mm -hmm. building but it was all locked up like i don't think they used it anymore yeah the, the one that was a little bit further up on not on the corner where the yeah, shop was on was, just, Hurst or whatever street yeah. was. yeah yeah but but further up was um about two doors up was the big building that was no longer used i think uh on sunset yeah that was that was the one where they did george of the jungle um okay. and and the, in the really hot and heavy days where there was tons of work but they no, that had all that they had all closed up by then. Okay. Yeah. Now, did they record right in that studio or somewhere else? No. Okay. No, they, there was a, a first of all the famous Glen Glen sound that you see right. on old movies. That was <clears throat> where they did all of the Rocky and Bullwinkles, and until about '65, and then when Hoppity Hooper came along, they went to a studio still on Sunset called TV Recorders. Oh yeah. And that was their place until. I'd say the last 20 years. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All very much in the Hollywood area, but just in the <laughs> industrial part of Hollywood where it was no glamour. It was just a right. just a little sound studio place. But uh, <laughs> funny thing is that uh, when I went there, 
I, to meet Paul Fries on another job. Yeah. Um, there was an, an engineer there called Alby, who was kind of a you know quiet, funny little eccentric guy. But when I came back in 1979 and went to that session, and by then I was already in the business, you know, no longer just a kid. Mm -hmm. This guy Alby said, uh, "How are you, Keith? You know, I haven't seen you for a while." And it was like, "Yeah." <laughs> like, this guy, this guy must have the best memory in the world. I was a kid then. It was like I was on on a holiday to Hollywood, you know. Right. <laughs> Bizarre. But yeah, they were they were great days. Mm -hmm. A couple other things. Switching gears again, of course. But you know, I'll put, mention the book again. Moose that roared. Oh, yeah. um, how long did it take you to write this? I mean, because you know, it just yeah. suddenly appeared in my my world. But you know, it's like, was it a decade or is it a yes. few months? Yeah. Okay. Well, no, it was it was a decade. What happened was that in 1990, did you ever see the little newsletter that Charles Ulrich put out called yep. the Frostbite yep. Falls Far yep. Flung yep. Flyer? And <clears throat> I ended up helping him a lot of facts on that, you know, and some of the articles and. Uh, Okay. And then he told me that they were looking to seek an author. And they had some guy at the Museum of TV and Radio in New York in mind. Mm -hmm. he'd, he'd done some article in a magazine. That I, I thought it was a bit <clears throat> inaccurate. And yeah. I suddenly just again wrote a letter to, to Jay Ward's wife because it had been a year since he died. So I figured, okay, it's time now I can approach them. Yeah. And said, oh, by the way, no, nothing about voices, just about my interest as a, as a writer. And uh, she said, sure, um, you'll need to send me a sample. So, um, and then that was in October of 90. And then March of 91 is just when I started doing the demo of all the voices. And uh, I got a letter just the day I was flying to LA in my letterbox from Tiffany saying, uh, congratulations, we have appointed you author of choice in our book on Jay Ward. And so, it was published in 2000, but the reason it was it was a long time. I mean, I I'd written most of it in two and a half years. Okay. The difficult part living in Australia was that I in those days no internet. Right. In the early the earliest of the 90s, um, so I was doing international phone calls sometimes at night to match morning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right. To all of these old <laughs> animators who are gone now, like Bill Hertz and all the names that you see in the credits. Mm -hmm. All of them couldn't have been more helpful. It was great. It was, it was becoming an easier writing job than I thought, simply because you do that prime research, as you know. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you approached and, and and got to meet all the people I'd love to have met at Total TV. You know, um, yeah. for that first book and and uh, um, so yeah, that. But then what happened was that after the VHS tapes came out and Disney did ten volumes, I think, of Rocky and Bullwinkle yeah, stuff. Yeah. They had all these lawsuits suddenly hit them at once. Um, mm. J Ward Productions, because suddenly everyone could smell, hey, there's money in this old property. <laughs> Alex Anderson um, <clears throat> wanted a, a little bit of the action because he created Rocky and Bullwinkle. And right. uh, until Jay passed, he had been his best old school friend and he felt completely um, shut out. Mm -hmm. And uh, the music rights were really what killed it. They killed everything, including the book. I was told to hold, hold, um, hold off and not do the book because um, they were in litigation, and there were these court cases. The uh, they used Frank Comstock's music from the old first season, and he had actually um, never sold rights to that music. He'd kept the music himself. Hmm. That's why in the second and all the other series, they, they were the music was by Fred Steiner, and by then Jay Ward had made sure that they were Jay Ward Tracking Library. You know that was a legal thing. Um, so yeah, the the book was on hold. Meantime, I started in the late nineties doing all these dubbing guides for them. What they were was for, for the foreign market where Rocky and Bullwinkle was was being shown all over the world, mm -hmm. especially for foreign countries like that don't have English as a first language, I offered to create a guide for every episode and describe the jokes and how, how they would best be dubbed into, uh, <laughs> it took me ages. But I think because um, I've done such an effort on that, that the legal people at Universal said, oh hell, let him go ahead. He can have, he can write the book. We're not going to complain anymore. They'd won most of their cases. Hmm. So, uh, Again, that was that was another 
awful thing because I thought, oh, I'm going to get the J. Ward book written and Bill Scott would have wanted this. And suddenly it was like, you're not allowed to write this book at the moment yeah. because uh, we don't know where we're going. Mm -hmm. So it was in limbo for about six years. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Same. Yeah. <laughs> it came out in 2000. I know that because it was, it was the publisher knew that by then I was doing the voice for the movie that was mm -hmm. still being shot. And mm -hmm. he said, why don't we try and <clears throat> he, he got in touch with the De Niro's company and found out what the release date of the movie was. And they timed the book to come out on exactly the same day. Hmm. Yeah. So that was kind of the culmination of all those years of odd, odd little things happening. That, that again, that little coincidence was the, the, the icing on the cake. Because after that, and after the Rocky and Bullwinkle movie tanked, a lot of the, the work suddenly started <laughs> downhill. <laughs> with my mm -hmm. American contacts, you know? Mm. Okay. So um, it's obviously been 20 plus years since oh, yeah. it came yeah. out. Uh, yeah. Is there any chance for an update or a sequel or did you pretty much put everything you could in the book that you I had? I put everything I could, but of course you, there's tons more, you know, did you see the book Daryl Van Sitters did? The yes, article? I do have his yeah. book. Yeah, I, I, I did a lot of the um, stuff in that book I provided for him, okay. you know? Yeah. In fact, we were talking, I think, before we started recording, you know, meeting June Ferre. That mm -hmm. I met her a couple different times, and that was actually the last time I met her before she passed. All oh, right. Uh, yes. He did a signing at uh, Van Eaton Galleries in Hollywood right. earlier. And mm -hmm. uh, he, he signed it, and then June signed it, and then um, Jerry Beck was there because he had right. a Peabody and Sherman book, and he signed yeah. his book. And, I think I, because that's in the Facebook era, I remember reading that that event was going to happen yeah, yeah that's right yeah so i did um, come down to la for that that's probably like the now last where do, you, where do you you don't live in la i i um... i do not i did when i was a little kid it, right. when, yeah. when you were getting tri free trips to the united <laughs> states i lived down there <laughs> but exactly at yeah. that time i honestly didn't know I, I didn't know cartoons the way i do now you know i i just watched right. them and so mm -hmm. i knew of Hannah barbera because they were on tv all the time oh yeah yeah and i knew of uh, warner brothers because they had the bugs bunny show on the weekends and um uh but i didn't really know like rankin bass or i knew yeah, disney right. disney had a nighttime a weekly nighttime show and right uh so jay ward was just one of those ones you know it, here here's a funny thing i'll tell you about it um uh i would watch rocky and bullwinkle but they mm -hmm. always had the episodes. It's like, join us again next time for blah, 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 or blah, blah, blah. And then yeah. the next time I'd watch, it would be like a completely different story yeah. at a yeah. different time. Because I don't know if they weren't showing them in order or something. But I thought that that was the joke. That oh, they never, I these see. stories never <laughs> ended. And they never started. They just kind of were yeah. in the middle of some adventure. And, you know, and that was the joke. Because they, you know, I knew they were filled with jokes. And I thought that was mm. a joke, too. No, that's uh, that's kind of a funny observation. That that is a kind of a Jay Ward esque way to look yeah. at things. But yeah. no, it and was never intended like that. But you yeah, know, that was I, Peter I Peach's grew, fault. I grew up in the in Northern California, so San Jose area, oh, and right. and I lived in San Francisco for a number of years. But um, right in the early '80s, uh, Channel Two, which was KTVU in San Francisco, they made this big announcement: we're going to show all the Rocky and Bullwinkle episodes in order. Well, mm. they really just showed the Bullwinkle show because I found out later they didn't show all the episodes. They just showed yeah. all the ones they had, you know. So um, so that was right. one thing I found out when mm. I uh, when this came out because it was before they put them all on home video. I said, there's a right. bunch of them I've never seen before. Yeah. <laughs> you know, now they're out. Yeah. But, you know, at the time, they didn't put them all on those Disney tapes and everything. But anyway, uh, prior to I had that, to write some of those I had never seen until right. the, the fire, full collection. But... Right. What what helped my research more than anything with Bill Scott was um, he um, allowed me to copy all of the original uh, recording session tapes. So chronologically, there was every episode, and I got what the plot was all about you know, from my own about that Because yeah. I kept my own little notes and everything. And when your book came out, I go, well, I didn't know about this. I didn't know about mm. that. I certainly didn't know about really obscure stuff like the Nut House and you right. know. For, and I never seen fractured flickers and stuff like that. But, oh, okay, you know, yeah. I yeah. again because I'm older. I I see Australia um, <clears throat> was the first country to get Rocky and Bullwinkle as a sale from America, mm -hmm. uh, first of the English language countries. And um, I was born in '53, mm -hmm. so I was only six or seven. And I used to get almost frustrated that I, although I loved it as a kid, would love a cartoon. 
my mother, if she was standing behind me watching it with me and doing the ironing or whatever she was doing, would laugh at some things that I didn't get. And it was oh. like, this is bugging me that you know something I don't know. So right. I was like one of these kids who couldn't wait to be grown up, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, again, I saw everything like fractured flickers in the right order as, oh, as they okay. were produced, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I had a sense of that history. But even so, once you got on the inside and met people like Skip Craig and Bill Scott, who gave you stuff from the studio, that, that's when you really started getting stuff that, as you said, oh, I didn't know that, you know? Yeah. And yeah, I, 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 kind I, of I learned, I kind I learned of all sorts things of things like, from. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, I, I learned all sorts of things from your book about Total. That oh. was another thing I'd been worried about, all, wondering about all my life. Like, uh, right. even though I knew it was based in New York. Yeah. Um, did you ever meet people like Jackson Beck, the, the voice artist? No, he was oh, gone okay. by the time I started doing the. the oh, one. okay. And I thought yeah. I thought he lived a long time. I didn't know whether he was still got to see it. Yeah, he was gone by the time I, the one that had died right before I started working. I was Don Adams, so I didn't meet. Oh him. yes, yes. Uh, I didn't meet Bradley Bulky. Um, right. I tried to meet uh, Larry Storch, who is still with yeah. us, but he is, uh, yeah. I had to go through some agent, and he wasn't willing to concede to an interview. And they yeah. and then. I found out he didn't remember anything, but then it it, it kind of has a happy ending later when some DVDs came out. They interviewed him for there, so I'm kind of like, oh, that's good. Yeah, that. he was a bit of an oddball, though, Larry Storch, and uh, I was friends with Will Jordan, who's no longer with us, but he they'd been friends for years and years as impressionists. Yeah. And uh, he said, uh, he said, uh, funny thing is, Larry, he said Larry Storch is a great movie buff. He's never owned a VCR in his life. Now, can you imagine that? <laughs> <laughs> those things, are both, that, those those really are both impressionists guys. too yeah, yeah that's right yeah, yeah. um oh, yeah. I, I did meet at least over the phone um all the principal the four principals of total television uh right. i met buck figures in person because wow. he, yeah. he came out to a hollywood show and i said if he's on the because all these guys live in the east coast so that's yes. a trick for me, but he happened to come to a Los Angeles show, which I was in Northern California, so it's only like three or four hours away. I can drive right. for that, and I did, right. and I met up with him. I took some photos and stuff like that. And yeah. uh, yeah, well, I always assumed that you'd been uh, living in New York when you wrote the book because no. <laughs> uh, it seemed like you had access to these guys. No, and, and it was tough yeah. because you said, oh, you didn't know Bill Scott did voices. Well, yeah. I didn't know who did the cartoons, though yeah. they only gave credit to the voices. If you look at well, the I used to I used to think um, the way a lot of people used to think, like on Jay Ward's cartoons, Ponsonby Brit. Oh yeah, was was um, obviously a made up character. Like they needed an executive producer, so we created this fictional guy, and that's I think I mentioned in my book, um, Treadwell Covington. Right. I used to think that was their equivalent of a made up right. but apparently he I was the recording that, guy. I thought yeah. that too. And then yeah. when and when I interviewed him, I said, You're not you're not real. You're not supposed to exist. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first thing I said, and he chuckled. He had a yeah. kind of a uh, a southern accent, you know. Oh, uh, right. He, he was right. from North Carolina, and so he kind of said, Well, Mark, yeah, <laughs> I'll be, I'll talk with you about underdog. It's really oh cool. wow, you know, yeah. that's kind of how he talked. Yeah, and it was really sad when they all started passing away. And I said, I, I just know. got the right moment because yeah, when I got them, they're all in their eighties, but they're all like still sharp. sharp. Minds. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. then you know suddenly they just boom, boom, all dropped yeah. out. Like, yeah. But you got to them. That's that's yeah. like Jordan Young always says. You know, all of these people that we love, uh, we've got to get to them in time, you know, right. <laughs> and get right. their memories. You know, and then the fortunate thing, and this is almost ready, not quite, but we're at the tail end of it. So I'm doing a total television scrapbook. I kind of wow. got inspired by that's what this is why I asked you if you did another book. Yes. And I forgot yeah. about Daryl's book. So Daryl right. Van Sitters did that big yes. uh Jay Ward book. And I said, Would you ever want to do one on tele television? He goes, ah, I don't do books. He's like, I did my Mr. Magoo one and I did this one, and that's enough. And right. know, I get yeah. it. You know, if somebody's not their heart's not into doing a ton of books, yeah. Right. Um, but me, I yeah, I kept the wheels kept spinning. I said, I'm gonna I should do one about total television. <laughs> So right. it is coming out. Oh, um, great. No, I'll, I'll I, be getting one for sure. I worked, I, the co-author is Victoria Biggers, who's Buck Biggers' daughter. And ah, right. after, and this is what really got me to do it, is after Buck Biggers passed, she was going through his stuff and she found this big scrapbook of like all these little items and stuff like that that 
I never knew about. She never knew mm-hmm. about. And I said, because I thought about updating my original book. And I said, I don't like updating books. I'd rather just write another book. And I can say, yeah. this was yeah. an error in the other book, which there are a couple. <laughs> yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah. And I had, uh, yeah. so I have an interview with Harvey Siegel and uh, this other guy named Bill Smith, who uh, worked for, uh, I forgot which company he works for, but he he's a big a fiction auto of the Macy's Thanksgiving parade. So you right, know everything right. about the underdog wow. and bullwinkle balloons, you know, and how they're Jeez. made and who designed them and blah, blah, yeah. blah. Yeah, know. I'd love to know all of that. Yeah, I so mean, the Harvey good. Siegel, you mentioned Harvey Siegel. That, that's one that I've kicked myself for for years that I, I never, from Australia, it was so difficult to learn where some of these people were located. And he's just yeah. a guy that I found out later, if I had interviewed him, he would have been a wealth of information about the Mexican thing. Yeah. And that's like, like uh, that's I had to go on a lot of old correspondence and things to learn <laughs> what I knew about Mexican <laughs> stuff. Yeah. So I, here's how bad my reporting is. And I'm embarrassed to say that I'm embarrassed. I, I reported in the original book, he was dead. Oh. <laughs> and he wasn't, at least then. The, I, the I late Harvey Siegel. <laughs> so the, that book came out in 2009. I interviewed him in 2014. Um, wow. I have not been able to find him, so he might have passed since. Uh, you know, yes. I don't know, but uh, I would say uh, that's more likely by now, by 2021, yeah. because they all would have been such an old age by now. But uh, yeah, because yeah. he was in his late 80s then, you know. So, yeah. um, but he was sharp as a tack. I right. hate to say, but you'll find out. You know, he was very critical of your work <laughs> oh, uh, in a certain respect. But you yeah. know, I understand because if oh, you yeah, no, that's fine. Project, yeah, you know. There was another guy, Sam Why not Sam Weiss, somebody else was also. Yeah. Sam yeah. Cornell, I think. Yeah. 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 Disagreed yeah. with some of my my conclusions. <laughs> right. Well, there's stuff about I, I could tell you already because I've already transcribed it. I can uh, is he said a lot of the stuff that was written that they uh were doing the animation at Gamma in two a building that was split in two because of an earthquake and they had to hop. He said, No, no, no. That would be just like the United States. They wouldn't have allowed uh, yeah. a building to operate as a business if it was literally split yeah. into. So that yeah. was just, you know, that was stuff that George Atkins had told me and uh, people like that from memory. But uh, yeah. yeah, all these things you regret. <laughs> yes, I, so. I I did get to do some corrections. Uh, they did do a a, a different coloured cover uh, than the one that you've got there, a yellow one. Oh yeah, the paperback which, one. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It incorporated a few corrections. Oh yeah. okay. I should probably see again one. George I Atkins. More, but I'm a I'm yeah. more of a hardback book fan. So yeah, I, said, I know. Yeah, you know, and I kind of <laughs> thumbed through it. I said, if it's not really updated, I don't need it. You know, and then but yeah, yeah maybe I should go get it. <laughs> you know, well, uh, he, yeah, he, I, I remember um, George Atkins gave me a lot of good info that's in the book, mm-hmm. but he was also almost ready to sue me because I I had taken as literal something that uh, Chris Hayward. <laughs> One of the other writers had said about him, yeah. which I may have been joking or something, but I just transcribed the interview stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was something about how George Atkins uh, liked to go to Tijuana. And it was like, I want, to, I want that retracted. And of course, I did change it in the, um, yeah, it was Puerto Vallarta, he was living. <clears throat> and uh, he said, that makes me sound like one of these old rum pots who went down for all the hookers in town. <laughs> <laughs> It was like, oh God, you know, you try to do the right thing and you meet all of these old timers and they right. sometimes they might say something that amuses them and you take the, you know, it's just, I'm, right. I'm transcribing all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I've had people okay. say, don't put that in there, you know. So yeah. I have stuff in here that's never yeah. been in some of my books. And yeah. I go, hmm, maybe later when they pass, maybe I'll put those. Yeah, well, I had most, yeah. most of my guys didn't have that sort of filter. They just told me stuff. They didn't say, don't put this. <laughs> well, no, they tell me stuff. And then afterwards, when, you know, yeah. I gave them, like I'd transcribe it and send it to them. Oh, don't put this part X. You know? and I go, okay, fine. You know, yeah. so I wouldn't. You uh, know? That was only, only that one thing that he was really upset about. With, uh, But no, most of the people like Bill Hertz and that, um, said that I faithfully transcribed, you know, the, the, the animation facts and all of that. So I'm, I'm happy in that sense. But uh, I, I've since learned, I think, just from, you know, 20 more years of experience that uh, you you call interview subjects back and make sure that uh, when you said this, did you actually mean, and sometimes it's, oh, did I say that? No, what I meant was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why, you know, 
unless I it's yeah. impossible. Like unfortunately, like I said, yeah. Harvey Siegel, I transcribed it. I didn't transcribe it when I did the interview because oh, okay. I said, well, I'm not doing a book. I'll just and I had it on a cassette. I do digital interviews now. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. Recorder, but I still had a cassette. And so this is about a year ago. I'm sitting there trying to transcribe this cassette and I go, thank God for digital audio. Yeah. I, I hate yeah. cassette tapes. Yeah. <laughs> but uh you know, then I tried to reach out to him. It might have been more than a year ago, but it, I tried to reach out to him again. And you know, I sent him an email. I, I mailed it in the mail. Nothing. So that's yeah. why yeah, I think he passed. I've but, had a, a, things like that because at the moment I'm still completing a book on the history of the old theatrical cartoon voice actors who, who were never credited. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> most of you know, a ton of that's leaked out over the years on Facebook because I've given little tidbits to some of these animation kids and all that. But that's all right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It'll still be a book when it's a book. Okay. But that even co covers an even earlier generation where literally everyone's dead, you know? Right. So um, uh, really a lot of this has just been research and research and, and uh, constant listening and, and comparing to old time radio shows and going to university archives. And, you know, it's, it's not as interesting a book in, in the sense of the talking to Bill Hertz and people like that on the phone. Right. But I have found a lot of really nice stuff, like USC's got the Warner Brothers collection, and I found years and years worth of um, recording logs of the old cartoons and you know stuff like that, and stuff that I thought would have been lost to the ages, you know. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but again, all of that stuff I've found for every studio, MGM, UPA, all of these studio, nothing's complete. They're just dribs and grabs, you know. Yeah. Even Disney Archives said, gee, our records on voices are pretty bad. And for Disney Archives to admit that, you know, that's amazing. Yeah. You know? yeah. Uh, it's yeah. frustrating, but little by little, it's getting yeah. better. Yeah. So. I mean, it, just as an aside, you know, I find it shocking that, you know, they did the reconstruction of bed knobs and broomsticks a few years yes. back. And that right. film, granted, it's 50 years old, but it's not as old as some of their other stuff. No, and no. it's like, they had to re-record voices with, by other actors because Roddy That's McDonald right. passed and uh, they yeah. lost footage. So they had to use still photographs. And it's like, it's not that old a movie. What happened? Mm, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, you know, I get it. It know? is. It's very frustrating. And uh, I remember, although there's all hundreds of stories like that now, but since, since the digital age came along, you know, I, I know when they, they were trying to recreate some stuff for, that was cut out of the original good, bad and the ugly. And, and, yeah. Lee Van Cleef passed during the, the whole process. So they had oh, to get yeah. a, a sound alike to come in and do some of the lines that they discovered. You know, so it's, it's a constant frustration. The, had the passage of time when you're into things from the past, because this, this 20 years of this century has gone by quicker than all the years of the last century in my mind. Right. And it's like, wait a minute. It's already 2021. Well, I, <laughs> I, I've had this conversation with other people before. Yeah. You probably can agree. You know, in the 90s, uh, right. We just assumed that all these elderly uh, animation heroes were mm. all going to live forever. You know, yes. yeah. you know, it's like I met Chris Freeling, I met Chuck Jones, I met all these guys, and you know, they yes. were lively yeah. and animated. And I said Bill Hanna, and you did too. And you know, you just like, oh, these guys are going to live forever. Now they're yeah. all long gone. You know, I was like, wow. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Chuck, I knew Chuck Jones very well, and uh, mm -hmm. um, some some of those guys. I never got to meet Bob Clampett. I wish I had because yeah, uh, yeah. his his knowledge was uh, was pretty deep, um, and Tex Avery as well. Oh, yeah. But uh, as a matter of fact, there's new Tex Avery volumes coming out. I don't know if you've seen them on Cartoon Research, but I've done articles about the voices that he used in uh, oh, yeah. his old yeah. theatricals. And I've done I've done one for this new volume that's come out now. Oh, so that's yeah, I haven't. Even, yeah. I need to order that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I just ordered it. It's yeah. just come up on Amazon now. Right. Um, but uh, no, it is that same thing. But, I, but the one thing that I've noticed is that uh, even in the early 90s, they were still playing a lot of the old movies, you know. Right. Um, and suddenly it's almost like coming up to two new generations have come up and not known any of that history unless they're right. just oddball movie buffs. And so I'm talking 99% of the millennials and all of this have no clue. And it's like, uh, yeah. They don't know John Wayne or any of the legends, right. Humphrey Bogart. And it's like, now I've got to really tell myself, so what? You know, I used to yeah. get really angry. Like, you right. know, 
<laughs> when I was doing the movie Rocky and Bullwinkle, the Piper Perabo, the young girl who was the kind of the lead kid character in that movie, I'm standing around doing all this shtick on one of the night shoots outside Warner Brothers. <clears throat> and uh, what happened? Oh, and I, I started doing a scene during Orson Welles in the scene in the third man with the, with the, the uh, Ferris wheel. And, and you know, the crew is asking questions and doing bits about movie trivia. And suddenly, here's this lead in a, a movie who's like 18, and she says, so who's Orson Welles anyway? And then, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're in the film industry. And, yeah. <laughs> so this is where I really got super depressed. <laughs> I, have, I have an Orson Welles story. So um, right. where I actually grew up is Saratoga, California, which is near San Jose. So it's- right in that general northern california area anyway they until like about the 90s uh they had one major industry uh it was palma san winery oh uh, yes yes they used to have orson welles advertising yes. <laughs> and it was very popular at least in the states nationwide i guess because of orson you know but that's right. what i knew him for <laughs> yes. originally yeah. well, when i was yeah. a kid and it's like then i found out oh he 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 did films oh he yeah. did War of the Worlds radio show. Oh, <laughs> he did all this stuff. You know, yeah. but all I knew yeah. about, ah, oh, the French, if you've seen the outtakes before. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, and I, I I even used to see the commercial, you know, make no wine before it's yeah. time. Yeah. And and all of that. But no, no, that's fine. But you know, I was like that uh, when I was a kid. I didn't know who the hell Al Jolson was, but I can remember even in those days, you'd get great old black and white series called Hollywood and the Stars, which had an episode about Bing or Jolson or whatever each week. Right. And I was taken enough, even at the age of 12, to want to go to a local library and learn about these people. That's yeah. what bugs me these days is that they just think, oh, that's that's old stuff. You know, yeah. they, they, they dismiss it just like that. You know? Right. <laughs> Well, that's why, I, that's I'm, why I'm, I'm more impressed when we mentioned him already, Amber Jones and Kyle. Yes. I mean, oh, yeah, Camden, that's, Camden, yeah. Camden, excuse me, I said his name yeah. wrong. Sorry, Camden. Anyway, and he's gotten me some good guests on my podcast here. He got the, the right. McKin, Bob McKinson Jr. He got uh, wow. uh, yeah. the um, sons of, uh, oh, geez, what's his name? Uh, Myron Waldman's sons, you know, and things wow, like yeah. that. You know, and it's like, Stephen I don't even Walden? know these guys, but yeah. I know who they are. But right, he's, yeah. like, he's like half my age and he knows these people and he knows it all backwards and forwards. And it's like, good kudos to you, kid. You know, yeah. it's like, absolutely. Wow. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like, no, I think that's great. And, and and I was amazed, you know, like everyone, uh, when Amber first expressed interest in Bill Scott, I was thinking, well, you know, how am I going to even begin to tell her all that I know? And I thought maybe she'd lose interest and all this sort of thing. And, yeah. uh, um, so I gave her a lot of scans of old letters and and um, interview transcripts and things that I had, but but she kept going and going and I'm thinking you know this is this is um, becoming serious. She really is interested in this. Yeah. You know, <laughs> at that age you tend to think a lot of kids get interested in something for two weeks and then suddenly they're right. onto something else. You know, <laughs> right? And I think most are that way. So yeah. I'm impressed. But no, yeah. I, as I agreed with Mark uh, Castler, who I've known for years, uh, that yeah. when we saw that preview that day. Um, once it got to his after Jay Ward years and his family stuff and his church plays and things, I could tell, wow, she's done some research here that I never knew anything about, you yes. know, and uh, <laughs> yeah, discovered that little footage of him doing the boy said back in 1942 at that army training thing and things right. like that. It was like, right. my, uh, yeah, so I was glad to be involved with it after all of that. Right. I think some people, you know, may have possibly found that she was a bit too pushy or aggressive but you know young kids who want to know something usually are you know? yeah <laughs> well, yeah i certainly was i think back to my time bugging jay ward about that you know right so, yeah <laughs> i have a quick question uh, just over the years um hmm. have you had anybody that you just kind of like lost it like became like Oh, you know, Mr. Jones, Mr. you know, whatever, you know, it just uh, lost it just like as a fanboy, you know. Oh, kind of, oh. yeah. Um, mostly they were the heroes, uh, like Mel Blanc and people like that that I, I got to meet. Okay. Um, no, I didn't, I didn't, never yeah. really did lose it in that sense uh, because um, <laughs> I guess I'd been in a performer myself for so long that you right. kind of just 
there are those levels in the business and um, right. you think all right Robert De Niro is up there and and uh, Paul Fries is in voices is up there um the only reason no, I, I really okay. I really can't think oh, except for maybe some of my old impressionist heroes like Will Jordan when I got to know him oh okay I thought I thought he'd be very remote but no he he was exactly like me um <clears throat> to the point of when I first met him, he was in his 70s. Yeah. I, I was in my 40s doing the movie on Rocky and Bullwinkle. I saw he, the old um, newspaper shaped uh, movie magazine, uh, The Big Reel or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, he'd put an ad in there at his age. He was looking for impressionists from the 1930s and 40s for a, a thing. He was uh, collecting samples of them on radio. He was still interested in who could do voices and impersonations at that age. And when I called him up, he had a, a friend of his who could do some voices at his apartment. And um, I started, we, he immediately started saying um, <clears throat> things about movie stars. And, and he started doing his James Mason for us. And, this. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I started, I did a scene from uh, a cartoon, I think it was, with Charlton Heston. And uh, I can't think even what the dialogue was, but uh, suddenly Will Jordan says, oh, quick, George, pick up, pick up the other phone. He's doing Heston. <laughs> it's like, it like he's still a fan of other people who can do impressions. And yet he was the guy who invented the Ed Sullivan voice and all of this sort of thing. Right. And uh, so it's, it, it's, it amazes me that uh, right. if you have this sort of passion for something, it never loses, loses yeah. or leaves you, you know? I guess, I guess, you know, that's kind of what I'm driving at. It, it is like, even when you do the voices, uh, right. you know, I just kind of like, you know, <laughs> you know, just because, you know, this is the guy, a guy that actually did these voices. And so yes. you know, it's yeah. like, it's really impressive, you know, it's like, um, well, yeah, the, I'm, the, I'm the, a fan the, of them. The one that yeah. just made me like on the phone when I was doing interviews was Bradley Bulky. And oh, yeah. I, I don't know why, because I've talked to anybody and everybody. I don't have a problem talking to people, but it was just that voice. And it was on the phone and mm. he just starts doing the G Tennessee, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's doing yeah. that. Voice, you know? Now, wasn't wasn't he the brother of another actor? Yeah, he was the brother of Dayton Allen. Who Dayton did, Allen. Uh, yeah, that's it. My, I dog. used to love his deputy dog voice, yeah. you know. And he also did the original voices on Howdy Doody, if you ever saw those. Yes, all the, all the yes. puppets. Until they yeah. fired everybody. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I had I had heard that. Maybe it was in your book, uh, the Total TV one. Another book of yours that I really enjoyed was the, uh, the Patty Freeling one. Oh, thank you. Because that was a studio that uh, had not been covered, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, there, I think either your book came first or the book that Jerry did about the Pink Panther um, his came, came his out. came first. And actually, oh, his, book, yeah. his book is, your, I'll tell you this, your book inspired me to do the Total Television book. Oh, really? Because I, it made, it, it always asks more questions. I go, well, what about this other studio, <laughs> you know, in yes, New York? Yeah. And then in Jerry's yeah. book, he did the Pink Panther and all the theatrical stuff. And I said, well, what about the TV stuff? And so, yeah. Well, my I, I still had the same mystery you had about the studio in New York until I spoke to Peter Peach. Yeah. Did you get to talk to him, or had he gone no, by then? He, he was uh, gone. But Tread he, Covington he was, gave me a lot he, of information about him. So I was who, who did? Sorry, Tread, Tread Covington. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Because he he um he was an enemy of some people. Yet <laughs> I found him I found him fascinating and very friendly, and uh, it was like maybe there was a personality clash or something. Yeah. Um, he told me that Bill Scott used to be very standoffish and uh, snobbish mm -hmm. until one day he, he was um, happy that Bill Scott came visiting for some reason and, and saw a collection of books and, and looked at Peter Peach as if to say, you? And, <laughs> and he, he said, I didn't say anything. I just let him wonder. <laughs> it's all these little snobbish things. <laughs> yeah. Well, I always get the impression of this, um, and this is the whole Jay Ward, Total Television, Peter Peach connection and everything, mm -hmm. is Jay Ward was always a little bit kind of annoyed that he had to use like a Mexican uh, animation yeah. studio, that he had to be affiliated with General Mills, that he had to do all these yeah hoops and things to run through, and he didn't want to share the spotlight with anything. Not that he was really that egotistical it was just he wanted to just be his own thing whereas the total television guys gave me the impression like you know 
we're all happy to be together and we didn't care yeah. about Andrew McBride was sandwiched between a Rocky and Bowling Ball episode <laughs> and uh you know we're we were kind of brought in because they were tired of Rocky and Bowling Ball doing all this Cold War espionage stuff and just do right. some funny stuff for kids you know yeah so, yeah. You know, yeah oh yeah no it definitely had uh the UPA um uh intellectual part of it on the Jay Ward side and uh, I think the guys in New York also are far more used to dealing with advertising people as yeah. just a matter of course, you know. Yeah. And they were advertising uh, men themselves. I mean, that yeah, TV show Mad Men is that, right. you know. Ah, Martini right, lunches, yeah. you know. <laughs> ah, right. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That, that fascinated me more than anything to find out they were advertising guys. Yeah. Because at, at first I was thinking, who are these mysterious people who are the equivalent of Jay Wood and Bill Scott in New York, a cartoon company? But then that that suddenly made perfect sense when I read your book. Yeah. Right. And yeah, in so fact, I, think, I uh, think that was General Mill's uh, thing after they saw a season of uh, Rocky and his friends. They go, right. all this moon fuel stuff, what is going on here? We just want some funny quick cartoons. Yeah. <laughs> you know? now, what, these there's episodes another last book, uh, 40 episodes and everything else. You know, it's like we want just yeah, short yeah. stories. And yeah. I think that's why they dictated it's like underdog four episodes only you know yes. <laughs> you know same with king leonardo too i think yeah. that was just yeah. serialized yeah. like four episodes yeah, yeah two or four yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah i used to i mean one underdog i could never complain about the the success of that that was that became huge for them and but i also loved the first one the king leonardo and these short yeah. subjects when it was when it was that format you know with the hunter and tutor turtle All right um uh, but uh yeah they, they probably um i i i, I unintentionally came across as very dismissive of those cartoons in my book but it was never intended <laughs> to be dismissive it was just comparing styles of humor i guess yeah and i don't mean any ill will when i said that it's like he said they were terrible cartoons i beg to differ but no no it's no, just no, all, all. all in fun because you know yeah. I, I love it all you know if yeah, anything I know. i'd be I, if anything i'd say and you know, i could say it now i'd be je i'm jealous that you got to write it because yeah. i this is a book I would have written had you not written it, you know. So. I know, I can imagine you would have. And, and I was like that when I found out they were using some guy at the museum that they were toying with the idea of uh, him writing it because I'd read a small article he wrote in a video magazine and it, it was okay, but it was sort of yeah. slightly, a uh, few of the facts were wrong. Yeah. And of course, Tiffany and, and, um, and Jay's wife weren't... Um, like me they weren't interested in all the trivia and getting everything exactly right so it was like uh, they probably just thought oh this guy knows what he's talking about and yeah you know, mm -hmm. uh, is that that big there's like a hardbound rocky and oh Bullwinkle. no that was uh, do you mean the rocky and bullwinkle book yeah now yeah. that came along that came along i think that was universal when they were with them in the 90s yeah and after they put a halt to my book universal said well we still want to do something that's very okay. you know of course it was a bland book because it was just really a picture book yeah and that's um, what i like it for but yeah i was like kind of disappointed with that one for that reason yeah. i was like where's all oh, the yeah. information you know and it's like yeah it was very light on yeah but he was basically a journalist i think who was just a, like a writer for hire and and uh because yeah. i remember jay ward's wife one night ringing me up at like midnight sydney time and saying would you be interested in collaborating with uh, somebody called Lewis Chinovich, and I said, uh, "No, I really want to do the book myself." So, okay, yeah. well, at the moment, we've still got all these legal holdups and things. So. <laughs> I yeah. never knew that. Yeah, I yeah. just yeah, and it like I said, that's years. why it seemed like it just appeared out of nowhere. It's because you'd written it almost yeah. a decade before. It so. was pretty much yeah. written, except yeah. once once it got the green light, then it was another year because the editor would then at St Martin's then took a look at it and said, "All right, let's juggle a few things around." And uh, as he let an editor do that because of their expertise, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think now that I'll be looking to, um, I guess, uh, is it Bear Manor Media? Yeah. Uh, for this cartoon voices book, but that's such a such a topic of of low interest to the general public that I'm happy to go with a publisher like that. I, did I tell you I tried with the um, University of Mississippi Press? Mm, <coughs> no, but I know they did publish a book quite a while ago on cartoon voices. It wasn't really obscure ones. It was more of the mainstream ones. That yeah, the mainstream knows. ones. Yeah. No, mine, mine is simply a, a finite time frame of 1930 to 60 where, where there was no voice credits except for right, Mel Blank right. being a special case. Yeah. Uh, 
but no, they started uh, when I sent them a couple of sample chapters being, being the age that we live in now, it was like, well, now we're going to need a lot more about race and representation and gender equality. <laughs> and it was like, I want to do a there book wasn't about any. cartoons. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Or, or they wanted me to really get very um, finger wagging about how incorrect all the cartoons. And I said, well, you know, there's enough articles about that if you're looking for serious discussion. I just want a book about all these actors who did voices and nobody knew their names. So that's all I wanted to do. So right. I think I'm just going to go with a, a, a small type publisher for this particular one. And then if I go, if I did a, a, an update on the J Ward book at some stage, it would be more with a mainstreamer again. Yeah. 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 Um, but it, uh, just got a curiosity, is there anything apart from like stuff in Amber's film that you discovered after the book came out that, said oh i wish that was in the book uh, that you can think of or is it pretty much complete considering that j ward ended so long ago as it were mm. as a studio yeah i mean the, the, obviously there's some things i that i would like to rewrite etc etc yeah. et yeah. but overall it was again a finite story it was 1958 to 84 when the studio right. closed and i was i didn't even think about becoming an author of that book until 1990 so yeah, there was no new stuff to discover, except maybe augmenting little bits and pieces on, say, something I learned about fractured flickers after the book came out. Right. But okay. again, see, I had one thing I, I had was uh, some really nice um, reaction to the book. But the, the inevitable reaction that I was expecting was from a lot of people who said, uh, this is too detailed. This is like a slog to get through, you know. <laughs> and uh, so... Uh, welcome to my book reviews <laughs> <laughs> that's I, I kind of expected that would happen because i am a bit a bit of a completist and i want to get I, I want to i mean it was edited anyway it was a lot of stuff uh, that i had to lose that probably was just too trivial right but i was glad that they incorporated the episode guide with all the voice credits in it that's a sort of yeah. In the next book, I'll be having filmographies for each studio. If you remember Leonard Moulton's book of Mice and Magic. Oh, yeah. How he, each each book was a studio, like uh, each chapter, rather. Yes. Mm -hmm. Warner Brothers, MGM, etc. My book's going to be the same, and the filmographies are going to be that, but they're going to be the voices of each person in each cartoon, as much as I've been able to learn. See, there's a lot of the stuff from the early 30s were just in-house people, who squeaked and did yeah. but 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 anything that was in the mid 30s has gone lost to the ages that do a spite diligent research I, I have not been able to turn up documentation mm. so there's going to be stuff where i have to tell the potential readers this is a work in progress i'm sorry you know yeah, yeah. if more is learned there'll be a revised edition believe me you know <laughs> what i'm hoping for is some of the really obscure people there might be great grandkids who come for, oh, my grandfather did a cartoon boy, and then suddenly they produce, you know, a whole scrapbook <laughs> of stuff. And then, right, you know, right. Stranger things have happened. But usually right. in that case, in a, in a, in a, an oddball subject matter, you do have to wait till you know volume two is going to come out of. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, um, yeah, that pretty much answered one question I did have is what you're working on, because I mean, we talked offline a, a while back and you're right. going to tell and we could still do this just uh discuss not here but i mean uh sure. you know how to get this book written and stuff like that so i was just yeah, kind of yeah. curious what topic are you doing but you know now i know so yeah well if it's uh, that topic but um but because of your being more, more prolific as a writer i mean one, <laughs> one thing that that held me up of course was that uh, um like daryl being an animator me with the voiceover career that I had for so many decades, I was simply too busy to commit to being a full-time writer, you know. Right. Uh, I'd have to let people down with deadlines and things. Yeah. And uh, so now that I'm no longer like that, and also now with COVID and, and we're locked down at the moment in Australia because of an outbreak of the Delta, <clears throat> I've been able to, to really fi finish off all the filmographies for the book. And I'm in the last stages of chapter writing for se several chapters. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's, I can finally see light at the end of a very long tunnel. I've been re researching this book since, boy, the mid nineties. You know? wow. <laughs> Mind you, Mike Barrier with his famous um, Hollywood cartoons, but that took him 25 years. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, people are always amazed how quickly I do mine. And it's like, 
Yeah. It doesn't seem like it when I'm working on it, but yeah, I, I, know, I, just, yeah. I, 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 I just, I'm sure, I'm sure you're like all, just all the authors. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you must be like all authors who, who use that old cliche. I, um, I don't like writing, but I love having written. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it's fun yeah. to show, you know, it's like our mutual friend Stu Showstack when he sees one yeah. of my books. So, oh, good. I have another doorstop. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then, of course, uh, the other problem with this book that I've got coming up is that uh, these days the world has changed so much where Leonard's book, they just used images from old cartoons they didn't have to pay any rights or anything right, Boy, right. that is a totally different thing these days so uh, okay. i've got to look at uh, a bunch of old photos that won't scan brilliantly like the digital age of of things that are just in keith scott's collection you know they because yeah. yeah. even even some of the photograph people you've got to pay enormous rights to these days so right yeah yeah I, i'm uh feeling that now uh with I'm doing a book on the turtles, the music group. Oh yeah, right. And uh, I'm finding like gorgeous photos that I want to use, and then, well, you have to pay a royalty here, and you have to pay a royalty yeah. there. Yeah, you know, it's like <laughs> I don't have the biggest budget in the world here for all these. That's, photos. Yeah, they. I wish yeah. there was an exemption for small press authors and, yeah. and niche authors, yeah. because let's face it, we are niche people. We're, we're not doing, yeah. we're not doing a mainstream yeah. that's going to sell. 20 million copies on the the sex life of frank sinatra or something you know it's <laughs> i mean sometimes i do get around it i mean in use the case of the total television book i mean i had the complete cooperation of the people who actually mm. still owned it so I yeah mean, that's right you know so they weren't going to say you know you can't use this because you yeah know, but, well um, even even as as recently as my book uh where under a character image, he still I still had to put the disclaimer thanks to Universal's legal people and say courtesy of Jay Ward, Tiffany Ward, Ramona Ward, right, the whole right, bit. Yeah. It was like, can I just say this once? But no, no, <laughs> it's a different it's a different world that we live in now. You know, it's, yeah. It's very as long litigious. as you get credit, you know, it's fun to you know at least you get yeah. it in there. You know, I hate it when they say, yeah. nope, absolutely not under any circumstance. Ah, yep. You know, and I've had and, that. Uh, but, you know. Oh, believe me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's what it's like all right uh keith i mean it's i know it's early yeah. where you are but you know well it's, it's already what am i looking at here it's uh 1 1 45 in the afternoon here okay. so right. yeah you'd be getting a bit up in time up there last yeah. night <laughs> we're at 8 45 p.m so it's yeah. not as late as it was that you're the night, you're the night before yeah, yeah. I, it's yeah. like it's like back to the future or, or... Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to monday <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah well great to great to catch up mark and uh instead it was difficult to try and say hello to everyone that day with watching amber's uh thing um but uh, yeah we will definitely cross paths again and i will i will get in touch as i near okay. the completion gate on the book and uh if there's any tips about being published and so on Okay. Um, I'll I'll pick your brain for sure. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. But, uh, okay. Yeah, most enjoyable and uh, and uh, what a great podcast. Thank you very much. Yeah. And that yeah. pretty much. Oh, one last thing. I always forget. <laughs> if people want to get in contact with you, uh, do you have a website or anything you'd like to plug? Yeah, it's a, it's just called www.keithscottoneword.com, um, and it's just. But really, that's more of a website for. Um, a few years ago where I was doing a lot of stand-up work at corporate functions. It's got a few videos of me doing impressions and things. Really, I, I would say um, if, if it's somebody genuine who who is, um, you know, a, a fan of old time movies or animation, and they just contact me on Facebook, a private message. And uh, then, I, then we can friend each other. You've got to be a little cautious these days. There are so many nutcases out there I who, uh, yeah. And people who want all your research instantly. <laughs> <laughs> you ever notice that you know yes um you know something that you're hoping not, maybe not even to make that many bucks on even but just to get a book published and something they want all of your and, and uh, mike barry has said some of the worst are university people they just instantly expect that they're students so you will hand over all this hard one research to them <laughs> right right <laughs> yeah no yeah. it's not that easy all right. Well, again, like we've already said, it is a pleasure having you on the show, Keith. Yeah, my pleasure. And uh, I look forward to another time, uh, maybe next year, we can do a, a follow-up about some other related topic in the whole uh, showbiz area. 
yeah. sounds good. Okay. Right. All right. I thank you very much. And thank, thank you. you. And you, for... you'll you'll take care of the uh, the turn off technology because I don't know what to do. Uh, yep. Yep. <laughs> I do the turn off technology. In fact, I'm leaning okay. forward, and here we go. And thank you. Oh, again. No. 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 Thank you again for being on another Fun Ideas podcast.